Well, I would like to continue, and uh, I am going to comment a little bit more about the question of, uh, well, do we just meditate on the present and let go of the past, or do we look into it? And um, Mingyur Rinpoche, he uh, frequently talks about when he was young, he had uh, anxiety disorder. And uh, it took him uh, quite a while to, uh, you might say, uh, overcome it or have it cease to be a, a problem. I believe that's a better way to put it, before it ceased to be a problem. And the way he did it, the way he describes is I made friends with it. I became, it became my best friend and I got to know it very, very, very well. And again, at that point, it becomes your ally, your aid because it no longer has power over it. You, you know it too well. You know all its uh, secrets, all its tricks, all the sly things that it does to fool you. So this is why, and this actually goes back to what I said in the beginning, where there's really two approaches. One is to keep meditating you know, really had to develop a very serious meditation routine in the beginning. And uh, that will help and eventually overcome um, many of your afflictive states of mind. And the other way is to deal with the afflictive states of mind. And then as you do that, you accumulate fewer and fewer uh, you know, less and less negative karma in your mind naturally settles down. It becomes easier for you to meditate. Now, uh, as I said, what I have found is that Westerners, our minds are just really wild and crazy because of various things. I'm 75 years old and the changes that I have seen uh, from, uh, and I'm going to sound like an old codger, but I mean, television was black and white. You only had three channels. There were only three networks. There was no digital world. The first computer that I worked on had its own building. It, I think it was a two-story building. It had, you used punch cards uh, and so on down the line. And now you've got this digital media, you've got 24 seven news cycle. You post something on social media and immediately a thousand people respond and gang up on you if they don't like what you said. And on and on and on and on and on. I mean, it's just crazy in terms of busy. There's so much that you can do. You could spend your lifetime on the internet uh, and never do anything else. And you'd really only gotten your little finger in it, you know, because it's almost limitless. When I first moved out here, which was 1971, if you wanted to see a friend, uh, it was common, just drive over there and see him, especially on a Sunday, because they're going to be home. And they're going to be free. Now you go and drive over to see a friend and they're not home or they're busy and they don't want to see you because they've got other plans. And that's just the world that we live in today. Busy, 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 busy. So this is why I like the approach of uh, um, Mingyu Rinpoche's and that is to look into these things, get to know them very, very well. And when that happens, they no longer are the boss. That now they are your allies and they're your aides and they help you. So you don't have, it's way beyond suppressing. Uh, it's again, using them for growth. And uh, so here is a story, uh, an experience. 
uh, is that um, when I was a prison chaplain, we had a, uh, a library that was managed by the chapel. It was our own library. And in this library was a video center. We had our own TV monitor and a DVD player. And uh, so I had the, uh, the prison by the movie Antoine Fisher. Everything in our chapel library was religious up until this point. But I thought that getting some psychology involved here might be very beneficial for the inmates. And Antoine Fisher was a movie um, about a, a black child that was uh, put up in a foster home. His mother gave birth in prison, I believe, and his father was shot. Probably his mother and his father were not even married. African-American. And in this foster home, he was physically abused, sexually abused, and psychologically abused. And he went into, uh, um, I think it was at 16, he no longer put up with it. And they kicked him out of the home when he resisted. And then he fell into the, uh, you know, the wrong kind of people and was involved in a botched robbery. This is how the movie went, but it was relatively accurate. Uh, and uh, the guy he was with killed the store owner. And then to get away, he joined the Navy. And then uh, in the Navy, he kept getting sent to the Navy psychiatrist because he kept getting angry and kept causing problems because he had uh, an anger management problem. And uh, so the movie just threw the psychiatrist who was Denzel Washington went through. Now, this is a Hollywood movie, remember, but it went through these episodes that he had as a child and kind of were explaining why he behaved the way he was. And uh, the movie had a happy ending where he reunited with his relatives on his mother's side and was accepted by them. So I had an inmate worker who was a Puerto Rican descent from Chicago and had started a gang in Chicago that was very violent. And when the movie came in, I had seen it quite a few years ago, and that's why I ordered it. But, uh, you know, I have to screen these things to make sure that they are suitable. So I called in my uh, this uh, inmate worker who was this Puerto Rican from Chicago to go get the, um, uh, the TV and the DVD player. And he brought it into my office, wheeled it in on the cart, and then he put it in there and pressed the play button. And I started to watch it and he left. And a few minutes later, he came back with some paperwork for me to sign. And uh, so I signed the paperwork and while I'm doing that, he starts watching it. And he keeps watching it and he keeps watching it. And I didn't say anything. I wanted him to watch it. And he watched the whole thing. And this was uh, in the evening shift. And then he had to go back to his unit, uh, to his room, his cell. And he came to work the next morning and he said, you know, when I went back to my room, I sat on my bed and I thought, and I thought, and I thought. And the next thing I knew, the sun rose. And after that, then he started writing down things and he showed me what he had written about his childhood and being a gang member. One thing really stuck out in my mind was that he would go into a gang fight, not caring if he lived or died. And I think that says a lot about, shall we say, law enforcement. If you don't care if you live or die, how could you care about whether you get arrested? 
but the point being is that this changed his life. He got transferred to another prison. And then uh, a few years later, he got transferred back to the prison that I worked at and then was released. And uh, it was probably a year, year and a half after he got released, I got a phone call. And this was, I probably should have reported it, but I didn't. And he called me from Chicago and he was just wanted to share, you might say the joy and the happiness that he had a job and that he was in trade school and he was succeeding in life. And I can't help but that movie is what kind of turned him around. And so it is going back, but doing it um, to investigate, to look at clearly and so forth, not just relive stale emotions, Re, you know, relive the same old, same old. And a little by little, little by little, you come to uh, make friends with it, get to understand it, and uh, transform it and use it. And uh, so that is uh, a little more uh, about the uh, that question. So it is important for us to um, uh, get to know ourselves, to be, you might say, be our own best friends. We all have what I like to call an inner critic. We have this voice inside that tells us that we're bad or that uh, we constantly screw up or we can't be, we make bad decisions. We're constantly making mistakes and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and make friends with that and just realize that this is not the truth. This is just one viewpoint. And there are other ways to look at this. Uh, it's really important to have confidence in your own Buddha nature, your own perfection, your own inherent primordial wisdom. And you might say you take this as a, uh, you might say on faith, that this is what the teachers said, this is what the Buddha said. But yet, if you look at these great teachers, uh, uh, if you get to know them, the ones that are alive, you'll realize that they are very, very different from an ordinary being. and that they are not trying to deceive us. They're not trying to sell us a bill of goods. They're not out for fame. Uh, Kenpo Carter Rinpoche was my teacher and uh, he wasn't out for fame. There were many teachers, Tibetans that came over to the West that built a vast uh, uh, number of students, centers, and so on and so forth, traveled the world. But Rinpoche didn't do that. He seemed most interested in a establishing the uh, KTD monastery and then the three-year retreat center at Karma Leng and training people to go there. And then training people that were there. Uh, I sometimes look at him as thinking he wasn't out for having lots of students. He was interested in having a few really good students. 
And it doesn't mean that there wasn't room for students on every level, then there was, but he really, uh, because of the three-year retreat center was really encouraging people, his students that wanted to progress more quickly to do these three-year retreats. He wasn't out for fame. He wasn't out for accumulating a lot of money. I know personally he gave uh, money away, a lot of it. Uh, all of us uh, lamas that were students of his, I think have had this experience where you give him an envelope with money in it. And before he accepts it, he opens the envelope and counts the money. And if it's too much, he gives it back. Uh, that, uh, and so when they talk about our Buddha nature, our inherent goodness, they're not saying this to deceive us. They're telling us uh, out of their own experience. So it's really important for us to try to at least understand that we can't experience it really because of our level of confusion, but it really is important to at least contemplate that. And when you get on the Mahayana level, uh, you run, uh, there is the, uh, the teaching on bodhicitta. Bodhi means awake and citta is mind. And bodhicitta is this wish to become a Buddha so that you can lead all sentient beings to become Buddhas too. Uh, it's a tremendous expression of uh, loving kindness and compassion. And the point is, is this is a quality of our mind. This is inside of all of us. And what we do is we uh, are purifying our minds so that this can manifest. We're not trying to gain it from a higher power or uh, something that is existing outside of us that we are just purifying our minds so that this becomes apparent. The uh, classic example is the sun and clouds. Clouds being our um, afflictive emotions, our afflictive states of mind, that they keep us from seeing things clearly. But the sun is always shining we just can't see it if there are clouds. We can maybe tell the difference between night and day, but we still can't see the sun. And quite honestly, even at night, the sun is still shining. It's just shining uh, on a different part of the earth, but the sun is always shining. It doesn't go on in the morning and turn off in the evening. I remember once uh, here having a, uh, a Dharma family gathering and uh, it became dark and there was a bright full moon. And one of the kids said, uh, the moon is on. Yeah, well, it isn't, doesn't work that way. <laughs> if the moon is, uh, uh, the moon is always, except for a lunar eclipse, the sun is always shining on it. It's just that we don't necessarily see it either because it's daytime or we're seeing the dark side of the moon. And our minds are like that. Now, the sun analogy is better than the moon because the sun is luminous. The sun produces its light. And the moon is not luminous. It reflects 
the luminosity of the sun and our minds are luminous, they're not reflecting the light of another mind, a greater mind, a higher power. Uh, our minds are luminous, just like the sun. It is said that loving kindness and compassion is like the rays of the sun. So it is definitely good to contemplate our Buddha nature uh, and our inherent goodness, our inherent loving kindness and compassion. That um, you could say, again, for another analogy, our hearts are uh, available 24 seven. Our hearts are always available for us to access them and uh, to use them to express loving kindness and compassion. So, um, I'm going to turn now to the uh, slogans from the seven points of mind training. And they are all very good and worth uh, studying and learning about. But uh, one of them is, uh, this is slogan number 55, liberating oneself through considering and examining. And what this means is that uh, we need to consider ourselves. You could say uh, considering and contemplating. Considering is, you might say, gathering the facts. And then uh, examining is putting the facts uh, into place, see how they fit together like pieces of a puzzle and uh, uh, you might say getting a clearer picture of what is happening. I liked the way that uh, Trollic Rinpoche, this is a quote from his book, Lojong, The Seven Points of Mind Training. And so here is the quote. A detective will investigate a particular case and then examine the evidence, analyzing the crime in both general and specific terms. If we approach our mental processes in this manner, we will solve many of our problems and clarify much of our confusion. Learning to know our minds honestly and fearlessly through these methods will liberate us from self-obsessive thoughts and overcome our mental dullness. Now meditation is also part of the seven points of mind training, but this part of examining and then uh, contemplation is uh, extremely important that uh, what we will find uh, will help us work with our um, confusion, our mental afflictions. Another one of the slogans is work on the strongest affliction first. If you uh, have anger as being the strongest affliction, uh, don't work on your pride. <laughs> work on anger first. And when you have some results from that, then maybe turn your attention to pride if that is the second one. 
I like to say this for those of you, we, you know, we're all Americans and probably most of us have applied for jobs and um, our uh, mental afflictions. I'm going to use the example of a uh, applying for a job. So you're having a problem uh, with uh, with life. Take your pick, whatever your, is your favorite problem at the moment. Uh, and uh, so we will chew on this, go over and over it in our minds. We'll talk with our friends and present the problem in a way that will make them agree with us. And uh, it's like we're applying for a job. And then we have a resume and we'll say, and this person did this, did that, did this, da, 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 da. Uh, you know, so I've had all these experiences with this very difficult person that I'm angry at. And then we have a, um, uh, a specialty, and in this case, our specialty is our anger. But then we have another area that we have a competency in, and maybe that is the, uh, the pride. They're making you feel like they're superior to you, and that's what really is making you angry. <laughs> when you know you're superior to them, in fact, I overheard this conversation once of two workers, and the one said, and I told him, I don't understand why you don't understand me. Uh, and uh, so there we are, you know, we've got uh, our letter of recommendation from our friends who agree with us. We've got our resume and we have a specialty and a competency. Uh, and uh, that's the way we go through life. So work on the one that is your specialty, the ecclesia that is your specialty, work on that first. And when that's no longer the most important one, then work on the one that is the most important one. So now it is important to not be too harsh on yourself. It's really important to see your faults, your mistakes, your errors, and so on and so forth. But you do not improve by beating yourself up. That's just more of the same old, same old. That uh, if you have ever worked with a dog, and that's the uh, an animal that I'm most familiar with, you train a dog by rewarding them for good behavior. And you hold off the punishment unless there really is not much else. And what I have uh, been told by people that do work with dogs is if you are going to punish a dog, the time to do it is when they are actually engaged in the action you don't want them to do. Not, not 10 minutes later, not five minutes later, but during the actual act. And I think this is good advice for us. You know, going back into the past and then uh, having this internal critic talking about what a bad person we have been because we've done this resume of all these things that we have done wrong. Uh, we're not talking about what's happening right now. You're talking about what has happened and nothing can be done about it. 
other than it can be purified. If it's really something that is bad, well, then confess it and purify it and let go of it. What I have found is a lot of times what we punish ourselves for are totally ridiculous and based on ego. Uh, for instance, uh, being at a dinner party and then um, an hour after the meal is done, you go to the bathroom, you look in the mirror and there you are, you got some spinach stuck between your teeth and you've been smiling all night long. And you go, oh crap. I'm so embarrassed, I made a fool of myself. And well, you know, this is humbling, uh, but I don't believe you've created any negative karma. It's really not that bad, but we can get so, this inner critic can really get down on us for doing things like that. For men, it might be, you know, forgetting to pull your zipper up. Wearing uh, a, a white shirt to a spaghetti supper. I, I recommend wearing colors like this to spaghetti suppers. <laughs> you know, the point being that this is embarrassing, but that's all. It's that, you know, it, ego doesn't like it, but that's fine. That's not a problem. Uh, and by looking within, you can start seeing these things. And you can start working with them. Uh, A, if it really is that uh, a bad an action, purify it with uh, a confession and mantra. And other practices, the only good thing about bad karma is that it can be purified. So uh, beating yourself up about it doesn't purify anything. It just keeps you stuck in the same place. It just makes your world very, very small. So purify it and then let go of it. And if it comes up again, well, purify it again. Comes up again, well, purify it again. No problem. We frequently get stuck in the, um, there are two directions we can go. See my fingers disappearing. One is when difficult things come up and I've kind of been in this place uh, talking about it is that you blame yourself. You know, I'm continually causing problems. I'm continually screwing up. I'm no good. I never have been any good. Life has been hard. Yada, yada, yada. And uh, it just leads to a feeling of powerlessness and hopelessness. Blame, by the way, is considered a worldly affair and um, not considered really spiritual. And the other attack, approach is that uh, you're blaming other people and uh, saying that I'm a victim. I'm getting screwed. The system is rigged. And so on and so forth. And then there you are. And when you are a victim, of course, your only, uh, you might say, recourse is that you have to change the world so you're, they're no longer victimizing you. And well, that might be a, uh, you might want to try it, but uh, I doubt if you will succeed. 
if you try to destroy enemies, what frequently happens is uh, for every enemy you destroy, uh, many more appear. And uh, you just create enemies by trying to destroy enemies. Uh, and uh, people have tried to change the world, try to conquer the world. And uh, it really never lasts. And it usually doesn't even come close to succeeding. And in the end, you die anyway. So being a victim just causes you to feel, again, hopeless and helpless. Poor me, poor me. When you're blaming yourself, you end up feeling helpless and hopeless and poor me, poor me. Maybe even uh, I've sat in on AA meetings and uh, I've even heard them say, poor me, poor me, poor me another one. Or leading to some other kinds of harmful behavior to kind of cover up all the inner turmoil. And in fact, that leads me into talking a little bit about uh, uh, laziness, because I think laziness is a good topic, uh, because this kind of tends to underlie the whole process of the mental afflictions. You could say that anger is the lazy solution to the problem. Instead of working with it, you just get angry. Uh, depression is the lazy solution to the problem of blaming yourself. And uh, so in Buddhism, there are three types of laziness. The first type of laziness is, um, I call it couch potato laziness. I don't know what the technical Tibetan term is. Interestingly enough, the Tibetan word for lazy, I'll tell you, and I will guarantee you, you will all remember it. I'm going to teach you a Tibetan word. The Tibetan word for lazy is lay low. Lay low. <laughs> lay means action. I'm not sure what low means, but this is the Tibetan word for lazy. So I'm going to be talking about lay low. Uh, so the first type is uh, couch potato. And that is just as it sounds, you lay on the couch, you've got the remote in your hand, maybe you've got uh, a beer over here or something else, maybe some other substance, and uh, you don't do a whole lot. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you start thinking of all the things that you've got to do, and you realize that I can't face this, I'll never be able to do this. I think I better go back to sleep, and you go back to sleep, and then at 10 o'clock you get out of bed, you eat breakfast, and by this time you're exhausted, and maybe you take a nap on the couch while you're watching television, and so on down the line. So that's the first type of laziness, uh, just uh, uh, doing very, very little. All the time, your mind is going wild. Your mind is incredibly active and it's full of thoughts of how bad you are and da, 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 da. The second type of laziness is compulsive busyness where again, you're avoiding doing what needs to be done and you feel like you're accomplishing something because you're keeping busy. But what you're doing really is not important or certainly not as important as what needs to be done. Um, video games. 
surfing the net, shopping, cleaning. By the way, if that is your busyness, you're welcome to come over and visit me. <laughs> I might even pay for your transportation. <laughs> but to go on here seriously, uh, there's just and all kinds of busynesses that we can get involved in. And they keep us from doing what is important. They keep us distracted. They keep us same old, same old. And the third type of laziness is self-deprecation, which is, uh, oh, I could never succeed, so I'm not going to try. And all of these keep us stuck. All of us, all of these things keep us stuck. So for the couch potato laziness, it's a, a very simple solution. Uh, this is what the Tibetans say. Uh, if you are sitting and a poisonous snake falls in your lap, uh, you do something, <laughs> you get up, you don't think about, well, uh, what kind of a snake is this? I wonder how poisonous it is. How old is this snake? Where did it come from? Yada, yada, you know, you know, you get up and do something. You get away from the snake. If you know what you're doing, grab it right behind the head. Uh, and so on and so forth. You do something. Uh, and Nike, what is it? Just do it. You know, it's the same thing. Just do it. Don't think about it, because if you think about it, there are going to be a hundred reasons why uh, you, you shouldn't do it. Or you're going to do the wrong thing. Or you don't have enough information to make a decision. Or... I should be doing something else. I should be doing this video game or making this telephone call or whatever. <laughs> you know, just do it. Cut out the, um, the internal discussion that you need to do something right now. And for the compulsive busyness, it really means sitting back and taking a look deeper into what you are doing and uh, factor in impermanence that a uh, your material possessions your house your car it's all impermanent b your body and this is even more important your body is impermanent you could die at any time this is what brought me to the Dharma was when my best friend was killed. And many of you have heard this story, but it made me uh, look at my life from the viewpoint of if I could die at any moment, what am I doing in my life that is significant? And this was before I had a Buddhist uh, contact. And my answer was not very good because it was, I don't have anything that really is significant and is going to uh, go beyond the point of death or even help me. At that time, I felt, and then when you're dead, you're dead and that's it. And uh, it's like, what am I busting my tail about here in life? And uh, it's important. It's important, A, to realize your Buddha nature and your potential in terms of bodhicitta. And taking into consideration that you take your karma with you when you die and this directs you towards your next life. Uh, this will help you decide what's important and what isn't important in life. And the third about self-deprecation, 
your Buddha nature is just as good as a Buddha's and that you are capable of accomplishing a lot if you try and you have aspirations. Aspirations are the most important thing in Tibetan Buddhism, that if you have good aspirations, you might achieve them or uh, achieve part of the aspirations. And uh, we make vast aspirations. We aspire to liberate all sentient beings when we take the bodhisattva vow. Not, well, I will aspire to, as, to liberate as many as I can. No, that's a partial aspiration. And needless to say, this aspiration has been made by countless millions, billions of Buddhists over the millennia. And there are still countless beings that need to be liberated. So uh, it's, uh, these aspirations are to be understood at that level, that it requires courage. I talked about courage earlier. And, uh, but if you don't have these aspirations, you will never accomplish it. So don't sell yourself short. Keep realizing, contemplating, uh, and perhaps studying uh, what Buddha nature is and the nature of mind. that this will help us go in a positive direction and not give up, not take the easy way out. And quite honestly, all of this leads to being happy. I don't think lazy people are happy. I think there's a lot of suffering in being lazy. This again is my own experience. And uh, uh, when I first started meditating, when I first came in contact with Buddhism, uh, I was on a very strong antidepressant medication and I was seeing a psychiatrist. And uh, I was not happy. However, I was really tired of where I was. I was really tired of being depressed. And uh, so I'm, and with this talk on these uh, blaming yourself, uh, I'm kind of speaking from my own experience. And uh, uh, what I realized was that, uh, again, I had a very, very, narrow, closed mind and viewpoint, that this is the way it was. The reason why other people weren't depressed and didn't see things like I saw things was because they were wrong and I was right. And uh, later I realized was, well, it's just a viewpoint and that I could change my viewpoint. And we all can change our viewpoint. And in fact, life is constantly changing. Cars are constantly changing. Clothing styles are constantly changing. The English language is constantly changing. Again, when I was younger, the you, only place you'd find a menu would be in a restaurant. Now that's probably one of the uh, lesser used meaning of the word menu. When I got out of retreat, you make a phone call and you'd get a menu. <laughs> and I'm not talking about calling a restaurant. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't have to go into the digital world 
uh, you know, menus are ubiquitous. And, they, and those kinds of menus never existed until recently. So things are constantly changing and uh, we need to, uh, shall we say, open our minds to impermanence and change. I saw a bumper sticker uh, a number of years ago that I really liked and that was that our minds are like a parachute they only work when they're open. Uh, so I, having an open mind is good. And maybe this is a good time to open this up to questions. So pause the record button again. The question was about uh, how do you purify? And there are four elements of purification and for simply helping to remember this, I call it, and this is my own category, the four R's, like the letter R. And the first is reliance. And so uh, visualize or imagine the presence of the Buddha, your guru, uh, Galwan Karmapa, somebody like that. The uh, second is regret. So think about what you did and have regret about it. And regret is different than guilt. Regret is that I've done these things. They're actions that I have done. But this is not my essential nature. And since they're not your essential nature, they can be purified and removed. Guilt is this is my essential nature and they, that cannot be purified and removed. So guilt is like trying to turn a lump of coal white. And remorse is trying to clean some uh, dirt off of a diamond where it hasn't harmed the diamond in any way whatsoever but it's a problem because it's lodged on the diamond. So that's the difference between remorse and guilt. Uh, again, when we go down the path of guilt, we start thinking, well, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. In fact, I'm constantly doing all these really bad things. I am a bad person, not that, uh, as opposed to I've engaged in some bad actions. The third is the remedy. And there are a number of different remedies. One would be a simple confession prayer. And if you have done the nyungne uh, with me or anybody else, uh, there is the 35 Buddhas or the three Skanda Sutra that is a long confession prayer. And then there is a shorter confession prayer uh, that uh, is done in the Nyungne. And it is usually repeated three times. This uh, prayer is something that I uh, will try to teach on in the near future because it's an important one. Uh, and then simply you can do the Vajrasattva mantra which we do at the end of some of these practices like green Tara, white Tara, Nyungne, and so forth. Uh, and if you have done Nundro, you've got the Vajrasattva practice. Rinpoche felt that the Vajrasattva practice was essential for his students to know and to use. 
Uh, the Vajrasattva mantra is very uh, powerful for purification purposes. Uh, the short Vajrasattva mantra uh, with the Tibetan pronunciation is Om Benza Sato Hung. Om Benza Sato. And uh, so that is the remedy. Those are different remedies. The fourth R is resolve. And this is to resolve not to do it again. And if you do do it again, because it's quite possible a habitual pattern, uh, then you engage in the four R's again and go through the whole thing. Uh, there's a lot of repetition in Tibetan Buddhism and uh, repetition works. So that is how you purify these negative actions. And again, it's important to not go down the road of um, blaming yourself and thinking that you are a bad person because you've engaged in negative behavior, that these are just superficial actions that you have engaged in and they do not harm your essential nature, your essential purity, your primordial wisdom, and so on and so forth. The question was, what is the Vajrasattva mantra? It is intended to purify any mistakes that we have done while doing the practice. So, for instance, I have uh, at my center, we do a lot of nyungne, and I have people say, well, I'm going to be making mistakes, and I'll probably be in worse shape after the nyungne than before it, because I'm going to make so many mistakes. And uh, of course, this goes back to laziness, self-deprecation. But the point is that uh, this is why it is done at the end of the Nyungne too, to purify any mistakes that we make, loss of attention, uh, and so on and so forth during the actual practice. So it's a really important mantra to know and to do when things come up that you want to purify. So I have been talking about laziness, about purification, and uh, so on and so forth. But it is always good to um, to look at our thoughts and let go of them. Here is a quote that I like by uh, Chandra Kirti. Common folk are fettered by their thoughts. Without such concepts, yogis are set free. The very halting of discursiveness is fruit of true analysis, the wise have said. So what this means is that when we're meditating, we're not trying to have no thoughts because that will never happen if you try. That it would be like saying, I'm trying to forget. Uh, or uh, a, a uh, teaching that I uh, have heard Mingyur Rinpoche give, which is that we're going to meditate now, and you can think of anything you want to while you're meditating, except for cheese curds. Do not think of cheese curds. He says this in Minnesota. You might say it in Wisconsin, but when I heard it was Minnesota. There are other parts of the country in the world where this might not 
get a smile. He would more get like a, huh? So then he rings the singing bowl and we're meditating. Don't think of cheese curds. And of course, everybody laughs. The point being that we don't halt discursiveness by forcing it or going in disassociating and going into a blank state. That um, it is accomplished by analyzing, looking into, and eliminating the source of the discursiveness. And of course, it is for us a goal that uh, takes a lot of practice, a lot of examination, and uh, so forth to attain. But I think all of us can agree that if we look within, that we think way more than we need to, that our, uh, our thoughts uh, seem to be uh, guiding us around rather than us guiding our thoughts around. That we can become the master of our thoughts rather than the slaves. And we can use our mind to travel the path rather than use our mind to blame ourselves and beat ourselves up or blame others and uh, feel like a victim. I guess it's also important to understand the difference between relative reality and ultimate reality. And um, relative reality is this world that we live in and that others live in that we have ideas about our experience the objects of our experience other people and so forth and we have a lot of shared karma and we experience things similarly Whereas now some of you have dogs and cats and they experience things very differently to us. Uh, a simple example that I like to use, now this is what I use to uh, hit the singing bowl. And um, let's see here. Now if I hold my from my face, you can see it. Uh, if I had a dog and would throw this, my dog, which was a Labrador retriever, he would go get it and bring it back. It was not something that you would strike a singing bowl with. So what is it? You know, is it a doggy toy or do you, is it a striker for a singing bowl? It's both. My parents, now, uh, while they were still alive, they moved and were cleaning out and they had a much larger version of this singing bowl. Uh, you can, and um, they're not Buddhists, but they had visited India and probably Nepal and bought it there and brought it back and uh, they had a potted plant in it. So what is it? Well, it's a singing bowl and it's a holder for a potted plant. And I could take it to a scrap metal dealer and he would say it's brass and weigh it. And then he would give me some money for it. You know, it's all of these things in relative reality. It's what we project on them. but we believe that our thoughts are real and our thoughts are right. Uh, 
So it's important to understand this. If you are hungry, um, cry this. Uh, instead of eating, just think about a fantastic feast you had one Christmas. Keep thinking about that all day long uh, and see if that will help your hunger. Because if your thoughts were real, obviously that would be the same as eating, remembering it. But I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that it would probably make you hungrier, maybe even a little ornery as you, the hunger got stronger. <laughs> uh, and we believe that our thoughts are real. And so this is a really important point to make that uh, in relative reality, what we are experiencing is our projections. We think they are real. So I'm going to bring up, this is one thing I like about Zoom. I'm gonna bring up a a work of art. So you can all see that, I think. And uh, so this is a famous work of art by a surrealist. And um, it says in French, it's Rene Magritte is the artist and this is worth millions, this simple painting. It says, this is not a pipe. And of course, he's toying with us, the viewer. And in his own words, this is a paraphrase, this is not a pipe because you cannot smoke it. It's merely a picture of a pipe. It's not a real pipe. And on here is the word pipe. It's the French word is even spelled the same way as the English word. Uh, and the uh, word pipe is not a pipe. You cannot smoke it. I believe he used the word fill it but to kind of, uh, you might say, fill it out. You can't fill it and smoke it. And the thought pipe is not real. You cannot fill it and smoke the thought pipe. So it's really important to understand how our thoughts fit in. We can work with them we can examine, analyze, go back, remember, and so on and so forth. But in the end, you have to realize that they are, it is just thought. It's nothing more than thought. They help us navigate this relative world it's really good to be able to read when you're driving so you can follow directions, know the speed limit, find the exits on the interstate, find addresses, uh, know that this store sells groceries and that one sells uh, uh, furniture and so on and so forth. It's good to be able to read Dharma books you know, all of this is important, but in the end, it's all relative reality. And the ultimate reality is beyond conception. It is beyond words. It's beyond being able to be expressed in words. So 
So what can be helpful, and this kind of goes back to a question that was asked early on, uh, another approach to these uh, afflictive uh, emotions is to realize that all of it, this inner critic, it's just words. It's good to get to know it and analyze it and become friends with it, but it's also good to understand that ultimately it's just words and it has no reality to it. It's just whatever we are projecting on it. So to kind of sum this up, with an understanding of relative reality and ultimate reality, you still understand that if you go out and uh, sit in the middle of an interstate highway, which has no reality, your body, which has no reality, will be hit by a car, which has no reality, and you will suffer a illusory death and experience a lot of illusory pain. So you have to uh, take into consideration the way relative reality works, but with a viewpoint of the ultimate. So I'm going to open this up for question. The question was raised about ultimate reality and relative reality. Are they two different things or are they related in some way? And very simply, the uh, ultimate reality is the ultimate of relative reality. And uh, relative reality is the relative of ultimate reality that they are not two separate things. Uh, that would be dualistic. A Buddha would see the way we sentient beings see things, but would realize that it is an illusion and he would see them from the ultimate as well. So, Take water, for instance. Now, there are six realms in samsara, starting from the lowest one, it is the hell realm. And again, this is created by the projections of being in beings in the hell realm. In the hell realm, water would be seen like a river of acid or a river of molten lava or ice frozen. There are cold hells too. In the hungry ghost realm, water is seen as being revolting, like pus and blood. Uh, in the animal realm, and the animal's karma is closest to ours, and we can see the animals. Uh, some animals see water as a home, like fish, amphibians, uh, certain mammals like whales, uh, and other animals. Uh, it depends. They drink it. Uh, some animals like to swim. Uh, my uh, part Labrador retriever. Now, I live out in a rural area and did hobby farming and had a stock tank and his idea of drinking water in the summertime was jumping into the stock tank. And when he got up to his neck, then he would drink. Uh, so uh, he viewed water as uh, something that was essential to be in. He loved it. Uh, and uh, cats, to the best of my knowledge, they like to avoid getting wet. They do not like to jump into a stock tank and take a swim. Uh, and, uh, but this is the way an animal looks at water, maybe something to drink, something to live in, something to avoid, 
something to jump into. Humans see it as a, a drinking, um, bathing, uh, washing your car, watering your lawn, industrial processes, and so on and so forth. We find it very useful, bottled water. Um, there are two God realms and the gods uh, in both realms would view water as being a bliss producing um, elixir. And a Buddha would see that this is how beings in these different realms see it, but he would also see it as it is, which is from the absolute, which is beyond conception, beyond words. So I'm going to, I'm going to go on just a little bit more here. And that is that each of us live in our own, you could say cocoon or silo. And our reality, our relative reality is different from everybody else's in uh, certain ways. Us humans, we all share a certain amount of relative reality. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have uh, people saying, and I told him, I don't understand why you don't understand me. And they work together. Uh, you can be married for 50 years and still not understand your spouse as well as your spouse understands your spouse. Um, and this is a huge problem because people think that the way they interpret the world, interpret their experience, in, interpret the way people close to them are, is only their interpretation rather than the way things are. So it's it's very very good to uh, to avoid jumping to conclusions and uh, thinking that you understand other people. It's really good to listen. People like it when you listen to them, as opposed to when you tell them what you think or what you think they should be thinking. 